Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to invite on stage our keynote speaker, architect Patrick Schumacher, Zaha Hadid Architects, London. Hi guys, good morning. I'm very happy to be here. I've been here in India a few times. This is the first time at this particular conference. And I do appreciate the combination of discussing ideas, showing work, and looking at the, all the suppliers who make that possible. So anyway, welcome. I'm very happy to be here. I will speak for about 40 minutes. And then I have a discussion over there about urbanism. And I have put together some images of recent work of Zadid Architects. At the end, I will also talk about research, which is also uh, involving the AA Design Research Lab. And I know that some of the AA Design Research Lab live and work in India, quite a few, and some of them are here in the room as well. So let me start. This image and the first series of images just should tell you and show you what we've developed is um, language of architecture, a new repertoire, which has a lot of diversity, intricacy, adaptive capacity, fluidity, to match up with the contemporary requirements of weaving a very dense urban texture with continuous, open, adaptive relations between the various parts. And this is happening on all scales, across all program domains, and it is a very wide-ranging morphology, nearly like the endless forms of nature. And also using all sorts of construction materials and techniques, the full repertoire of contemporary uh, technologies. And we're also at the frontier of developing technological systems together with partners, with engineers, and that leads to a new style in architecture, which I've been calling parametricism. The latest instantiation I call tectonism because it's more recently been able to integrate more of the engineering and fabrication logics which give shape and allow us to shape the built environment. And again, this operates on across all typologies, including the tower and I will show a number of towers and what we are innovating with respect to towers, both in terms of urban integration as well as in terms of internal uh, communicative intensification within towers. We are also a design company. We are a global design company. We are looking at interior design, product design, but also the design of vehicles, fashion, furniture, so there's a totality of the design disciplines which form one universe because in the end, the total built environment and the world of artifacts together shape human interaction, frame social interaction. And that's what I will focus on in the end. It's all about how we allow economies of agglomeration, the collaborative cooperative process of societies and cities to become intensified and more productive so we all gain in freedom and prosperity. That's the end game. I will just start sharing some good news from Zadid Architects. We just won a number of competitions. This is Shenzhen Science Museum and we are proud that we are still winning work of major cultural buildings which define cities and their cultural and educational communi community. So that's Singapore Science Museum, a beautiful site on the water and directly connected up with, 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 with major transport as well. The series of bridges, huge open flexible rooms with a lot of interaction with the exterior and a lot of exterior spaces on the roof and around the building to really create a destination in the park there in Singapore. Directly connected up with the railway station. And also you can see these big openings means that we are communicating with the outside, generating desires to step in and addressing um, that part of the city. Of course, on the inside, it's also about 
making, opening up, making transparent, having intuitive navigation throughout these spaces. And then always the view back out. The structure of these trusses, bridging long span, and they also become expressive in the exterior. So we believe of showing structure in our project. And you can see the way we're addressing the various angles and approaches to make that building open up in all directions. We also just won uh, Shenzhen Science and Technology Museum. Both of these are very large in terms of museum sizes, over 50,000 square meter each. Again, this is on the park side, directly connected up with infrastructure. And again, it's opening up, addressing the, uh, the park and the city. A lot of outdoor space and the major central space of events, of suspending artifacts, etc. Okay, so that was a good news, but very recent. Now I want to show you a few urban development projects, city extensions, which are all about this new phase in technological development, what I call the post forest network society, the knowledge economy. And on the one hand, we need to densify inside urban centers, but there's also a scope for having urban extension. So this is Moscow Smart City, beautifully located on the, on the river. It's a competition we won, and we're going with high density, with blocks, but we're also opening up the blocks, so we have garden spaces and pedestrian circulations through that. And then in these blocks build up in the center, nearly to tower height, but we're trying to keep public spaces and terraces and open spaces on multiple levels and have a kind of layered approach where the retail and communication spaces on top building up office spaces and residential as well. And this has been a theme in particular, also working with technology companies, a lot of this is in China, like Tencent, a new high technology campus in Tencent, building office spaces, cultural spaces, research, as well as residences, and retail on the waterfront, all together in an integrated mixed use development. Here it's not high rise, but it's layered and open, so multi level exterior communication space. You can see it's all about creating a web of communication. The co location is here not to work in parallel, but work with intervisibility and intercommunication potential. Of course, we're also looking forward to new forms of transport. Another project in China, this is so the, the previous project was in Xi'an, this is Chengdu. There's many multi million population centers in China. This is a cluster of high technology development called Unicorn. This is trying to incubate the next generation of unicorn firms. And again, it's high density, at the same time, it's an idea of garden city with a lot of exterior spaces, terrace spaces, mostly offices, some residential hotels, and the first exhibition uh, uh, center already under construction. I mean, this is all very fast-paced. And as we work in China, we have accommodated to the fast pace. This is literally six months after winning this competition, we're already at that stage. And there are these older industrial sites, harbor sites, like in the western cities, now in China, they're up for redevelopment for these cultural communication hubs. So there's another high density garden city in 
Qingdao in North China, where we're looking at high density urban typologies, co-living, small units, a lot of exterior connective spaces, and um, a lovely high density garden city, eco city, knowledge city. And then on the waterfront, there will be a lot of cultural destinations. And yet another of those high-tech cities, smart cities, uh, this one is in Chongqing. So it is right at the edge of the city, a piece of beautiful landscape. And here was a challenge to build something without destroying that landscape, intensifying and activating those slopes and landscapes with these deep spaces going negative as well and having integrating residential university spaces, office spaces, lab spaces into this kind of intricate weave into the, low, in the slopes. And again looking at transport, a lot of pedestrian transport, cable cars, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. And China is pioneering autonomous vehicles. That will be the first places where they, you will see them moving uh, and joining the, the, the infrastructure systems, as well as drone flying. I'm just showing this to show that we can build such field structures with courtyards, with covered exterior communication spaces. Uh, with, this is the research center in Riyadh, which comprises um, conference facilities, libraries, but also office spaces, workspaces. You can see here the way light comes through skylights into atria, but also into courtyards and covered exterior spaces. So I will interplay in this lecture rendered propositions and build works, and you can see how far we can simulate in advance what you will get, and we can deliver in time and on budget. This is, I just came back from a Middle Eastern trip, so I'll share some images of what we're doing there. This is also a, an office building. Here it's out in the landscape because it's a new energy and waste management ecological company we're building the headquarter for in Sharjah, and it's a cluster that also focuses on public relations. It has a beautiful courtyard, has reception spaces and open office spaces, and then the landscape um, surrounding. And it's wonderful at this stage of the development, it's actually only this one building in the desert. We are developing a whole city around this though as well. That comes later. This is the courtyard, so it's a, lo it's a lovely um, work environment for, for a major ambitious corporation in the United Arab Emirates with a wonderful uh, reception space. So this is the simulations, the open office space, the areas uh, always connected to the courtyard, to the exterior. And this is what happens on the ground right now. It's coming together. In uh, a steel structure with GSC cladding, but also there's a fair face concrete dome, which is a shell structure which holds the major space. It's an in situ cast shell in the heart of the building. So we've been developing these works which are embedded in their context. That could be an urban context, and I'll show that later, but it could also be a more natural landscape edge, river edge, 
and where the different buildings interface with the ground surface which connects them. This is in Changsha, a multi-venue cultural complex. Also working with levels, working with entrance situations, and the composition of multiple buildings, and again looking at communication spaces, lobby spaces across levels, which allow the different events to communicate. This is the Great Hall, two, over 2,000 seat opera auditorium. So these are built results which are indistinguishable nearly from the renderings we offered initially at the competition stage. So this is what we can achieve if we uh, design nearly file to factory with complete 3D models including all subsystems, structure, and knowing what we're doing. And when these elements arrive on site, they come together seamlessly. And uh, work out very well. There's also a museum, multi-level museum next to that. So that's just been finished and we have on site, I just want to share that in Rabat, Morocco, another opera house. And again, you can see the way it sits of the river. It has a series of outdoor spaces, outdoor amphitheater, indoor amphitheater, a series of terraces to step out to enjoy the landscape. And it generates a beautiful space around it. And it's a similar technique of fair face concrete combined with steel structure and uh, fiber concrete. So, something we recently completed is public realm, urban activation, riverfront in this very center of Hamburg. This is actually an ecological project in the sense they're building a flood wall, but at the same time that flood defense wall becomes a new public promenade with these cones linking back to the water to open that and back to the city and generating a beautiful series of spaces, urban spaces to enjoy, and making that barrier kind of an inhabited asset. We recently won a, yet another cultural icon in the city of Yekaterinburg, Russia, into that dense urban fabric, we slip, slipping into that a new concert hall with two major halls. This is the way it sits and embeds itself into the urban context, the way it opens up an entrance to the street, it opens up to a garden with an amphitheater, etc. And it addresses two streets, the main entrance, beautiful lobby spaces, and a major hall with 1,800 seats. And the second room, which we experimented before, where we want to bring natural light. In a concert environment, you can do that and bring views into the garden and inspire also views back into the hall. Okay. Some of you might know that we are doing a new airport for Mumbai, Navi Mumbai, we're very excited. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, airport uh, with the first terminal being in full design and there will be terminals two and three as well to create an ensemble. I'm not allowed to show you that, although I think your prime minister has seen the, the, the designs and is approved. I will show you instead what we've just completed in Beijing, the new airport in Beijing, Beijing Daxing. It's actually beautiful. It's on axis with the Forbidden City. So it's part of a major urban axis. 
in the south of Beijing. It's the biggest single walkable terminal. So compared to the terminal in capital Beijing Airport, right now by Foster, where you always have to take a train to connect, you can walk and interchange. And you can, you'll see in the end, you can actually see the whole airport from the land side. You get a full visual grasp of the airport. When you, once you step in here, this is land side, this is a central communication space, then light guides you out to your gate. At the end, we have actually exterior gardens to bring you. Uh, I think it's a very successful piece, very bright, easy navigation, and um, it is our first marker in the business of airport. So this is the model. And you can see model and reality are a good match. So this is the way we simulated the experience with a major communication hub, the light lines, and the columns, which are at the same time, same time light wells. And you can see there is no other columns. Go to any other airport and you'll find a grid of columns that totally column-free space is an amazing asset as an experience, but also for working and reworking the smaller units which you also designed, which is the retail uh, occupations. So this is exactly what you get in the end. That's the way we simulated that, working with levels. under construction, totally column free except of these series of petals and connected column with light well. This is the build reality. On the ground. This as you approach Very welcoming. We also have this feature of the light columns at the exterior, at the overhangs. When you step in, it's incredibly open and the whole broadside is open to view. The domestic arrival gets this experience. So you're not excluded from that entry point into China. That's domestic arrival right there, right in the front space. The check-in zone right next to it. And you can see already when you step through the main, cons the main orientation star leading you out later. To the final edge already. So this is the main space. Actually, you can perceive that from the land side. You can overlook that on different levels. So these are snapshots I made when we were just recently there. Uh, from the land side overlooking the air side. And you can see the systems, you can see the, tr the, the, the space frame and you can see the, uh, the guts through this layer of skin. So we we're happy and proud of, of, of this one. And um, I tell you that the Mumbai A airport is not falling behind. We're doing the next level with that project. Uh, train stations, infrastructure, I'm seeing you investing in the metro here. We are in the business of metro development. I've just been in Shenzhen to meet with the metro group. Uh, we're working on the metro in, in Riyadh. In, in Ukraine, in Oslo, 
This is the first fast train station we completed in Naples. But I want to show you, I've just been to look to site, the King Abdullah Financial District metro station. It's the biggest metro station in the world, where many lines on different levels come together. So I'll just first show you the design. And you'll see later how beautiful a light this comes in. So this is a metro station which is reminiscent of traditional railway stations where you have the big kind of glass uh, spaces, but adapted to the local climate. So it is not directly exposed, it's all shaded. But it also has a big entrance atrium. And you'll see later multi-step level atrium to step into. And then has various bridges connecting to it. This is the interior spaces. The big atrium, multi-level train arrival. So the, the idea is the dunescapes as well as an inspiration. The structure. And the structure is such that we have used the diagonals and we, all the staircases and escalators are following the structure. So we don't have any verticals. Everything is flowing in the diagonal uh, and uh, paralleling and fitting structure to circulation. And then we have the beautiful uh, window cladding fitted and again, this is only possible with the contemporary technologies of BIM technologies, where everything is understood and preconceived. These are thousands of panels. They're all different, but we have the logistic capacity to deliver that. That allows for that organic expression to come through. And to ad let the building adapt to different conditions without um, penalizing construction. When you step in on the platforms, you can see that those diagonal structure and circulation coming together. The way lighting is built in. And you see those beautiful light flooded surfaces from the inside as well. Then you move up the escalators. Here we're coming to the main atrium. Okay, so this will take another year and we will have it at the G20 um, event opening. And just to show you that we are able to do these, take these projects on, they're, they're super complex, multi-layered, integrated with, with infrastructure, engineering, and architecture is a very, very tough call. And you need to have that track record and experience. So we did this big underground station, retail, public space project in the center of Seoul. It was a competition. And again, you have an amazing undercroft world. And we're trying to bring green space and bring natural light down into this world of infrastructure. That's the guts of the city. But without that, a metropolis like Seoul, one of the biggest cities in the world, you would have a, we have a collapse. And I don't know how in Mumbai you can live without metro. <laughs> you know, if you look at places like London, so that's a very, very important investment for the uh, sustainable, high productivity city. We're working also, even smaller cities like Oslo investing in these kind of systems. So we're doing these two, two stations, each with two entrances in, in Oslo with the underground there. And we're building it into the landscape, two stations, urban and landscape, in one of the stops. And then another two at another stop, 
you can see they could be quite different. They're, they're, they're embedded, they're adapted to their context. They're not necessarily um, one repetitive element. And here we're modulating from a square to a circular condition, which is also represented in the two sides. Exits. Another interchange in Sweden, where we have uh, train stops with uh, a bus terminal, as well as uh, a development tower attached to that. So it's a kind of integrating infrastructure place, which should become a place where you can uh, also have retail, where you can have a new urban activation. And we just won this competition for the new uh, train station of the high-speed train, but also connecting up with the metro to the airport, uh, Ray Baltica in Tallinn, Estonia. And these are difficult projects to make sense of them, to make them urban connectors. The idea of the bridge we had as well in, in our Naples project. This is China. China is now nearly 50% of our market and they're investing heavily in rail structure, infrastructure. These are high-speed rail stations and these stations also become urban hubs. So it's a kind of transport node, urban development, TODs, which we're working on. And you build directly high density on top of the station and then the whole urbanism around that. These are massive, massive uh, stations. They're like airports. And again, we're trying to bring natural light down and make that a, a space of connection orientation, major, major um, uh, distribution spaces, like the traditional railway stations. But I'm intercepting with the recent build. This is a new urban complex in Milan. It's a mixed-use complex. The center is uh, office towers with retail, where we was involved in the public space and retail as well, and as well as some residential. This is city life. This, this is actually on axis, a major axis, which is marked by the top. And then the building twists around to, re to adapt to the local uh, on-ground conditions. This is, you see the access coming through the tower. You also have an open vista through the core, a cut through the core. And then we have a multi-level public realm which, uh, which receives that tower. And visual connections between uh, the tower and the uh, lower levels. A residential tower with a lot of amenities on top, on mid-level, with retail on the ground in Miami. And this is one of our first projects where we're working with expressing the structure of the tower. We have done that a number of those researches at the Design Research Lab with various competitions. This is the first built uh, version of a skeleton tower. Which also is interesting, a skeleton should not be the same at the, at the bottom, middle, and top. So it changes the density, it opens up, and that means there's the programming adapts with different types of residences at the different steps and stages of the tower correlating with the structure. So you have a single apartment on top, then two, and then three below, and a very, very open uh, sky lobby for residents to share on the top. It also has an interesting corner condition. It, and the, the, the condition of balconies, etc., cetera, changes. And you can see, if I prove to you that this is real structure working hard 
taking away the pressure from the core. It's a very slender, it's a very tall building with 65 stories. But the way this was built is the world's first. We actually have um, prefabricated fiber concrete panels encasing the steel and being the lost foam work, the foam, not, uh, the foam work which stays in place and gives you a much finer detail. But the appearance of a solid structure which you can touch, which you have in your space, in your apartment space as well. And it actually turned out that this is a relatively fast form of construction. Well, we took big risks with the client because of global first. The pool area and the top of tower. Some of the interior. We're doing complete projects, so we do full interior design as well with these projects. So the, the research behind that is something we're doing at DRL, Design Research Lab. We're working on new kind of uh, evolving, you know, topology optimized structural system. Because we have ambition of cantilever, of big open spaces, of atria, and of an optimized organic expression. So that's the way we work. These are studies of the students. We're building these kind of towers. Uh, and we always have then the attempt to bring this research into uh, our design project in the office. Probably the students coming along as well. We've done that with shell structures, with tensile structures, with skeleton structures. And I'm doing it now with the research at the end I will show you with the new kind of performance simulations in the corporate realm as well. So the, 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 the collaboration and uh, symbiosis between a firm like Zardin Architects and the school like the AA and the Design Research Lab for the last 25 years has been uh, an absolutely critical component in the success and continuous innovation capacity of the firm. So here's another of those skeleton projects, exoskeleton, which allows an interior freedom. And I will come at the end more to talk about these atrium spaces, which are made possible and, uh, by these kind of structures. They look complex, and they're crazy complex, but they can be done. And this is from the first sketch and her handshake to final delivery, five years. This is the take of the handhold uh, uh, camera. What the skeleton allows on the inside is a space of flying, a space of freedom, of visual connection, where all the offerings of the tower become navigable and visible like moving down a street or up a street. And it's just a fantastic sensation. With all the elevators panoramic. And the various spaces strung along. But also, the rooms have, you know, the corner free, uh, 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 the column free corner, Interesting facilities like pools in the room, and, and at the very top there's a pool as well. And I'm showing you this kind of idea of towers now embedded in complex urban spaces, mixed use, multi level with outdoor spaces. A study with it from Mexico City, also with an interesting structure. This is research, so we sometimes do just speculative studies like this to show the clients what we could do for them. And I think it's a lovely image of a tower which is more like a piece of the city, a vertical city, than a tower where you disappear in, a, in an elevator and a corridor in totally segregated cells. A sense of interaction between towers, within the tower, atria, open spaces, etc. And I'll show you a few more. These are studies, competitions we've done, for instance, 
This is two projects in Sydney, and the complexity is extraordinary. In terms of the residential park, the way it lands, the way we have to address multiple volumes, address different streetscapes, and the desire to not make that monolithic, to make that vary, that the hotel looks different from the apartment, from the office building. So there is a that differentiation of articulation, but also there's a certain unity. And then the tower kind of pulls out of that. Super complex projects. Uh, all you see, most of it is from our hand inventing different facades, the retail, again, the hotel, internal streetscapes in, throughout the projects, the backside with the office spaces. You see the passages going through. Um, in the internal courtyard, you can start to see these terraces of the hotel. So it's, it's really a very intricate, highly, highly intensive design exercise to develop such projects. And uh, it's not something which you can learn from within a kind of months or something to create. So this is one of them, and then creates a kind of strong silhouette on the city, Sydney skyline. Mid-level podium, so suddenly you're on that roof terrace and enjoy the city in a different way. There's another one in Sydney on the park, a similar kind of condition, uh, mostly hotel and residential, and we want to bring the tower down to the ground, not being, in this case, floating above the, the podium. And there's a very strong urban embedding as well, and an attempt to differentiate the product, the hotel and residences. And again, podium level uh, amenities, an atrium leading up to that. And I have more. So this is Shanghai. There's going to be eight towers landing into this kind of fabric. Some of it will be demolished, but there's a lot of the fabric we're keeping, historical assets. Also, the streetscape is to be maintained with retail spaces, with art spaces, etc. So this is where we have to work, not on the tabula rasa, the way you roll out here and elsewhere in the suburbs, we actually talk about urban densification. I think that is much more urbane and meaningful than spreading out into the landscape. And so it's a very, very intricate stock taking of what is there, uh, being sensitive to this, being, being used, and then still a massive increase in density coming in on top. A lot of garden spaces will be there as well. So this is the way that we, 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 we keep fabric, we add low level fabric, and we generate all these gardens. And this is the way the towers hover and interface each tower differently with different ground conditions. There's also different articulation, two families of towers, and there's also an attempt to activate with amenity spaces throughout the tower and the different typologies for retail, for additional townhouses, etc., to create these streetscapes, pedestrian streetscapes. There's parking all underneath that. So I think it's a lovely uh, um, attempt. So this is the kind of hidden gardens you, you get. And then again, you have, you have skyline and top penthouses on top of that. Sunken garden as well, reusing some of these historical assets of art spaces, public spaces, and additional product in terms of townhouses. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very dense, nearly collage, but we're trying to give it unity and coherence as well. Now looking at the top, and there we get, of course, a fantastic play of terraces and sky gardens, and uh, the sense of connection. And I can show you this. We did a VR model of the whole project, where you can fly wherever you want into every space, every apartment, and embedded in a city model, where you literally can fly through the whole city. 
And that we can now run our machines. We have special fast powered machines. So when we, I presented it to the client, I just went real time and I let him go and he said, go here, go there, go here. And he can, he can look at everything. Then you can convince clients uh, that these kind of level of complexity can be handled, can be delivered. Now, so I've just came back from Beijing. This is one of those projects where we're talking about a new type and typology of towers, which is um, the atrium tower, where, where, you, where you get visual communication to the city, but also within the tower of the different departments, the different players, and you get a fantastic sensation up the tower. The tallest atrium in the world, 200 meters, and what is important for us to look across to be on these bridges, but also to look back into the urban space. Just at the opening. These are kind of shingle elements where, the, where you get a bit of openable in the, in the, in the edge. And then the fantastic views up and down the tower. This is across the tower atrium, the view down. We have an exhibition there about 5G labs. So this is the first 5G, fully 5G active building. This client is also running their own um, co-working product. So you can online book a table on an hour's notice or book rooms, very flexible. Very innovative, and this is the recent photographs of a, of a fantastic photographer who went there, made these, made these amazing pictures. Because it's a thrill, and we have already movie teams lining up to use that space. So this has happened to all of our spaces, even the one we did in Chennai, there's features in some movies. Because that's the future. It's a fantastic uh, play of... Uh, light and, and reflection you can get from this. And I'm just going to show you a few of these atria spaces we've created around the world and we're simulating and our ambitions are growing with each new project. Uh, this is for, 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 for Seoul, uh, for Taikang in, in Wuhan. And we want to do those kind of interior urban spaces in towers. or exterior spaces, clusters of towers connected by bridges. This is the next second version of this. I have to speed up and terraces and atria activating these, these buildings. And ideally they connect between towers as well. So I was talking about the sponge space vertigo, uh, that these are the kind of spaces that express the complexity and dynamism the communicative intensity of contemporary network society. I had, there was a show at the Royal, College of, uh, Royal Academy in London where I put out this manifesto. Because we're talking about this shift from Fordism to post-Fordism, and I think it's happening in India as well for quite a while, where we have this dynamic ecosystem, and that's where we have to grasp this fluid interaction spaces on large floor plates and with kinetic maybe malleability, with simulating what's going on, and this is the research we're doing at the AA at the moment, I will just walk you through that, that we need to uh, process life, the model a life process to understand these complex spaces. And I have both work with students, but also have a research group at the university in Vienna, as well as in the office, to start to simulate interaction and understanding what's going on, how to dispose, and we're doing empirical research in our own office. And then we are simulating the office processes, and we're trying different layouts. Because that's the dynamism and openness of open textures of agile working, where you're roaming around free, and you cannot easily know what you're offering, what you're doing without uh, these kind of um, simulation capacities, where we also simulate uh, 
the different characters, the visitors, the different status groups, the different team members, and we can track what they're doing. And this is for clients like Google, Tencent, uh, the big tech companies. We're doing it actually for a big technology hub in Moscow at the moment. I'm going to show you that when we come to this. So we, we, we've gone quite a far. This is now simulating our own office environment, and I don't have time to go through with this. Uh, just, and we, we, we built uh, in-house software capacities on top of Unity where we can run literally thousands of agents with different schedules, with different uh, uh, agent populations. We can track encounters, we can track conversations, we can track uh, utilization of each spot. So there's a full statistic coming out of this. And then at the same time, we, we work with students developing these complex sponge-like open spaces where we sim visualize and simulate these agents, in this case without quantification and scientific elaboration, but this feeds in more on the design side, and in the office so at the moment we're building up the science capacity for that. So this is, um, we're then embedding that in urban centers like Manhattan or uh, London, and you can see here, these are the kind of spaces, so thousands of people on a floor plate, and that's, no you, that's not unusual. We're building at the moment a building with over 3,000 people on a floor plate. Uh, and how do you manage this? How do you know what you're doing if you not build these simulation capacities? And you can see each of these spaces has intervisibility across levels in the depths of space, but also intimate zones and subzones and it doesn't have the vastness of an empty space. So, so these are, I think, model buildings, and they could also move up into the tower. And we are building these scenarios, and we are filling these spaces with the activities we can imagine. And the latest stage, as I'll show you at the end, is where the furniture itself starts to reconfigure with AI-empowered spontaneity and as well as scheduled agendas. And I, I don't have time to go through all of them here at the moment, but you'll see that there's a simultaneity, a layeredness of simultaneous ongoings, but each of these different people might also want to connect up. We have that problem, we have 400 people, the different teams know, know always what they're doing, they need to interface more, we repeat research. We need this kind of, the whole point of co-locating is, is that exchange of skills, knowledges, of cooperative opportunities. And for that, we need a new type of space, an openness, an inter-awareness, an inter-visibility. And we need to know what we're doing. How am I distributing 50 meeting spaces or 100 meeting spaces in clusters at entrances? How do I interface um, um, work zones and departmental zones? So that's a totally new way of working, a new capacity with the building to deliver towards this agenda of high productivity social space. It makes a more satisfying and productive work live environment. So this is the way we're actually working on this. This is a technology park. Uh, and this is literally a, a mega floor plate with atria, of course, across levels as well. This is over 20,000 people will work in this building. Uh, it also has urban interfacing and it has these uh, spaces. So we have standard floor plates, super floor plates, and we have mega floors. This is with more than 3,000 occupants, and they need to be grasped. We also work with levels because a flat surface would be not visual interactive enough. And we have developed, developed algorithms of populating these floor plates, and then we're running simulations and trying to optimize that. Lighting plays a role, uh, and we're developing, developing furniture systems, and we're developing, uh, again, this simulation capacity. Uh, tracking, communications, and we're also showing the client what could happen, what will happen. Uh, uh, sorry. We're building the agents, and we're going through scenarios and testing, et cetera.
So this is Spurbank now, applied research. And the detail we're putting in is uh, very robust. And we can tailor these to the various corporations, their departments, their people, be importing their communication data, etc. And these are the utility functions, so the complex AI decision processes which are embedded in each agent. And then we simulate and compare different settings and we measure encounters, how much conversion of encounters in, com in conversations we get, uh, overall social performance modeling in parallel to all the engineering who does kind of technical building systems modeling. And the latest thing is that we're doing for a number of years, and this is, takes long, responsive environments where we want the elements of the building to change with the life process, and we want to have social interaction engendered and tracked by uh, AI-empowered furniture, this is a long-term agenda at DRL. This was even in the late 90s we started this. Uh, we have interactive ceilings. We have been doing this. And now finally we're getting close to implementing this. We want to generate a startup company allowing for that. And we, we, we're envisaging this kind of symbiosis of social and, 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 and agents, human and architectural agents, uh, sharing a productive life process where schedules are anticipated, where responsiveness is embedded, and where we know all the different situations we can now generate and create and pack them into a single space and orchestrate them. I think it's also more stimulating than um, just speed that up for you. You can see the different configurations. So we... You can see that we simulate different configurations always with the different social interactions which are generated. Actually, I'm out of time and I'm out of processing power. So let's have a, I'm done. Let's discuss. There was more, but. Yes.